It started with three women trying to save the building. They were saving the old corner house, which was intended to be torn down for an urban renewal project, which was sweeping the nation in the 1960s. And Patricia Daly, Norma Ogden, and Rosamond Sherwood were determined that the old corner house would be saved. Well, I think really I was very interested in the house, you know, that I thought it ought to be preserved, and, and there were all sorts of awful things coming up that were going to be torn down. And, and it was going to be made into a meat market and all sorts of things like that. I had heard some rumor about it, but when she brought it up. I agreed with her that that would be a disaster for the town and that uh, it was a lovely building right in a very prominent place on the main street. No, and I'd really give Norma full credit for having started this. Um, she was the one who really saw this need, and uh, instead of, like most of us do, we complain and don't do anything about it, she said, hey, let's, let's, let's do, do something, something and uh, bind uh, us up. And so she was the one that really put in the work. So that's the way it started. Um, we each put in 5000 and the Rockwells put in 15000 What they did is they formed a corporation called the Old Corner House Stockbridge Historical Society, Inc. And that was the first name of the museum. And uh, they were going to move some of the historical things of Stockbridge from the basement of the library next door into this house so people could see them. Maybe they thought eventually moving the whole historical room over there. We had changing exhibits, exhibits about the Indians. We had one year, we had an exhibit about the Berkshire Theater Festival. And one day, Norman was in there with Molly and he looked around and he says, a lot of bare walls here. Why don't I hang up a few of my pictures? And so they hung up a few of his pictures. And it wasn't long before they realized that people weren't looking at the little old historical stuff, but they were looking at those pictures. And I believe uh, that it was the four freedoms that he gave the museum outright, and he had them stored in his uh, studio. Uh, so when people saw those four freedoms, uh, they were just aghast. They, they were really impressed. But all of a sudden, what do you know? The only thing people wanted to look at were the Norman Rockwell's pictures. And so that was really, as I say, a museum founded by accident. And so that was how it all started. When the building first opened, I believe people came in the front door. There was a small reception desk. The first directors, the house managers, uh, sat there and welcomed people. We stopped in New England, in Pittsfield to be exact, uh, to visit our son and family. On a Sunday afternoon, he was taking us on a drive uh, through the Berkshires, uh, pointing out various uh, places of interest and we came through Stockbridge. And suddenly he said, oh, we must stop at this new museum, uh, which uh, features some of uh, Norman Rockwell's uh, paintings, and uh, we'd like you to see it. So we did go in, and the museum had only been open uh, a little over a year. This was still 1970. Believe it or not, we were the only people there that whole afternoon. So the Mr. and Mrs. Buck, who were uh, running the operation at that time, spent the whole afternoon with us and we found other things to talk about besides the paintings. And we signed the guest book. So two days later at Jack's home, uh, we had a telephone call from Molly Rockwell. So my husband talked to her, and she told us that they were looking for a couple to uh, take the place of the Bucks. He consulted me, and I said, why not? We can go back home and tell our friends and relatives that we were at the Rockwells, and that would be very impressive. When we arrived at the um, Rockwells, 
We found also there Jane Fitzpatrick, a member of the board, and Doug McGregor. Well, that's a pretty powerful and persuasive bunch of people. So they convinced us that uh, this is what we should do, uh, take over the running of the museum. Well, I came in the summer of, of 74, July 11th, 1974 to be exact. And uh, I came into a maelstrom because, of course, obviously summer was, was and is the busiest time for the museum. And in those days, busy was a couple of hundred people a day. Um, I was really got a kind of baptism by fire because I had walked into a, a going concern. The museum had been going for since 1967, 68, and Margaret Batty was the assistant director, sure her husband had died the previous New Year's Day. Margaret was as helpful as she could be, although she was still suffering, I think, considerably from uh, the grief that uh, her husband's unexpected death had, had caused. And so I came into a new job with, uh, I think, a lot of trepidation. And uh, the circumstances that summer didn't, didn't help it much because nobody had much time to break me in. But Molly set the tone early on in a way that was so dignified and so beautiful. She really was my hero, and, and she didn't even know it, but I, just, I loved her. And the first meeting that I went to as, on the board, I was maybe 40 years old, it was held at Riggs, and it, there was a big corporate table that was the biggest, shiniest table I've ever seen. And it was quite a hostile environment for some reason. But in the middle of it arose a real spat that was so awful. So after the meeting, I said, I don't want to be a part of this organization if that's the way people treat each other. Literally, that's what I said. And Molly, God bless her, and this is where she set the tone. After that meeting, we always had uh, our meetings in her living room. And she served tea in the most dignified way. She was simply wonderful. Walking through the corner house was walking through someone's home with this incredible collection of paintings. It was like, it really was like it you're was going, a home. To, it was like just you're going to someone's home. home. It was very casual. And all these, this great artwork on the walls. And I always remember it was so unusual because you could walk right up to them, you know, and you can really look at them instead of, you know, you had to be standing so far away from them. You walked in, uh, the entry was through the addition, which was the, the sales area and the little admissions desk that was right there. And Margaret was dead set against any form of technology or any form of electronic anything. We were at a point where we, there, there were days at heaviest peak where we would admit several hundred or even go over a thousand people a day and everything was being done on a yellow legal pad with a pencil. And they would enter, come in the store and wait until a group of 25 people would assemble and then they would be invited as a group to enter the museum building, the old corner house building and step into the first gallery. I believe we went in a counterclockwise rotation and uh, it, it became so busy that each room would be filled with 25 people and every docent would have to move their group at the same time in order to free one room up to step in and so you'd be snaking through the building and going up and down the stairs to people um, going up and coming down at the same time and then uh, coming through to the last room. If it got really busy we would suspend tours and staff would position themselves in a room and we would do what was called open the house which meant we couldn't keep up with the crowds and people would just come in and walk around and then we would just go non-stop until we locked the door at about 20 of five quarter of five and, uh, and then filter people out until shortly after five and that would be it but to be able to say i mean every day was so different and unusual. Um, it would be really hard to say, oh, this is what a typical day looked like, because I'm not sure 
I'm not sure we ever had a typical day. <laughs> I was working at the old corner house the day that John Wayne came into Stockbridge to pose for Norman Rockwell for the Cowboy Hall of Fame. He came into that building and it was just incredible. Everyone was so flabbergasted he could hardly fit into the front door. He was so big, so tall, and what have you. He had in his cowboy hat, which he promptly gave to one of the guys, an elderly lady called Angel Peck. She was French and she just got laughing so hard because he put the cowboy hat on her head. He wore his guns all over Stockbridge and you'd see him at walking everywhere. Norman would always open the studio so that the guides could come over and meet him and, and have light refreshments and see what was going on in his studio and, and so forth. But then gradually we moved that to the corner house and he would come on those occasions. I mean, he always stayed very much in the, in the background, but he, he still was tremendously interested in the, in, the, in the museum. I think one of the, the things about Norman and his relationship with the museum was that I, I don't ever think in all of his life, at least not in my knowing of him, he really understood the, the drawing power or attractiveness of his paintings for the public. And time and time again, he would, he would just shake his head to think that anybody would come any distance at all to, to see his pictures. Uh, they were, as far as he was concerned, just the routine things that he turned out for the commissions that he was paid to do, post covers, advertising work, story illustration, book illustration, whatever. And uh, why anybody should want to come and see them was quite beyond him. During the latter years of his life, uh, there was established one year a uh, Norman Rockwell Day. That was in 1976, and it was the biggest parade Stockbridge, I swear, ever had. Um, I believe they lined up way to the four corners, all the way, and they ended at the Berkshire Theater. People were packed on both sides of the street. They had floats, they had bands, they had children. Norman and Molly were there. It was very large. I think it lasted like three hours. The only thing I remember about that is um, we had a, a lemonade and cookie stand on the library lawn. And the whole town turned out for it. And remember your Uncle Don and his family came up for it? And let's remember the, the is float. Is that when you did the float? That's when we did the float. The uh, fire department in Glendale uh, did this float. Uh, and it was... It's a self-portrait. Actually, we had two. We had the triple triple portrait. Oh, and you had Al, um, Mrs. Brayman. We had Mrs. Brayman who was the teacher. Was the teacher. Yeah, and, and the kids and the, and It was went, great. And we went and got desk and so we had her there. We had the blackboard and uh, we won first place. Yeah, and I don't think he really understood the, the, the depth of that thing. I think he was honored by it and he certainly took it in good stead in his curiously understated manner that he, that he that he always had. And of course, two years later, in November of 1978, the time of his death, um, it was really quite, a, quite an astounding occasion. People, as you say, coming from all over, um, the funeral being so well attended, and press notices from all over the world. After I graduated college and had finished my work as a docent at the museum. I first became a researcher and was the museum's archivist and was given the project to uh, create his definitive catalog, really uh, take over the research files that had been started and organize them into a book, The Catalog Raisonne on Rockwell's art. So I shared an office upstairs on the second floor of the old corner house in the southeast corner with David Wood, the museum's director and bit by bit the catalog came together until it was probably in about 20 cardboard boxes in the office with file folders for each painting and eventually um, turned into a manuscript. Well how I met Laurie um, is through the corner house he didn't even have a copier and she at that time then she started working on the the definitive catalog and um, she would come and spend hours standing at the copier at the library, and that's how we became friends. Within a decade of opening the doors in 1969, it was clear, one, that the museum was extraordinarily popular 
and successful, and two, that, that the museum had completely outgrown the quarters of the old corner house. The building was really taxed, uh, and it was going to wear out. There's no question about it. The, the crowds became larger and larger. Uh, the attendance was something that became concerning not only to the board, but to the town. Uh, the town was concerned about the, the parking issues that and during prime time, we're talking the summer months, uh, the uh, parking challenges downtown Stockbridge uh, were something to begin with during that period of year, but then have a show of, uh, let's say, four or 5,000 people come on a Saturday or Sunday uh, to see the Rockwell Museum really put a stress on the, not only the town's infrastructure, but the old corner house itself. Before you knew it, we had so many people coming in that it was dangerous for the paintings, for the building, and the public school kids next door who were getting on and off buses. I was terrified. I was on the school committee at the time, and I was terrified a kid was going to run in, in the path of, of our crowds. So serious discussions were had about what should we do. Uh, clearly, we realized that we had to go out and find a different uh, facility, possibly even build one. And then we started looking around for uh, land options, uh, other building options. And I spent a good many years perking most of Stockbridge. <laughs> it's okay, you know what, it's fun. And, and um, oh gosh, when I think about it, and everybody was, uh, there were sites that were not appropriate that some people got on the bandwagon for, and there were other ones that didn't come up. There was four or five sites that seemed to be very appealing to us, and those were vetted and looked at, and uh, fortunately the Linwood property uh, proved to be uh, available. It required some zoning changes, so the politics of addressing that in Stockbridge, a small New England town, was challenging to say the least to get a zoning change, and it was a zoning change just to allow the museum to exist over here uh, based on a certain size footprint. So um, it, was, it was a lot of emotion, a lot of people on both sides. Yeah, this pinned a, a, a lot of people in town wore this uh, to show the support, and they wore it religiously all the time. We had our green buttons, vote yes on Rockwell. Uh, people had yarn, yard signs out. Um, there were like friends who weren't friends for a while. It was, it was very hot. It was a very hot issue. It was a tough time in this town. I mean, it was hot to the McCoys. The final meeting had to be held in the high school because there were so many people. I, I think 950 people or something. It was unbelievable. It was an amazing thing. And Molly with her gray hair, you know, oh, she was a commanding, wonderful, beautiful person. So the vote was had and we got 77%. We only needed 62, I think. And uh, the front page of the New York Times the next day had Molly voting. And I mean that, you know, for a little town with a big idea, you know, we, that really made us feel like we had arrived. Well, Norman Rockwell's museum uh, was basically willed to the museum by Norman Rockwell. And in their, in their estate plans, the studio was to be gifted uh, to the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, at the time he made that arrangement, however, uh, there's no way it would have fit in the backyard of the old corner house. However, as time went by, uh, the clock was ticking and, and Norman passed away and then Molly Rockwell passed away. Well, by that time, fortunately, we had purchased the Linwood property where the museum now resides. The museum wasn't here. We had still hadn't had a, a selection of an architect to, to build whatever was to be built. But the, we realized that the timeline was such we had to move that studio to the property. Fortunately, we have land now to move it to. Yes, I mean, I'd like to tell you about all the meetings and the advanced planning and how much work it was and how difficult it was and uh, how we actually made it happen, but that's not true. Uh, Lori Norton Moffitt and Lila Burley really grabbed a hold of that move and set everything up. And the only thing I had to do on the day that it was moved was show up with a cruiser, a, a couple of other guys that, that could work at uh, different intersections on the way out to, 
to this location and uh, actually it had kind of a party atmosphere. The day the building moved was a beautiful day in March and we uh, walked behind the building like a parade. The school children were out of school and the building had been lifted up onto large wheels, sort of truck dollies that it was pulled and towed down the street and it was just a really fun, wonderful, uh, festive parade day, a beautiful sunny day and the building went all the way out down Main Street, out Route 102 and down 183 and we had to work to have the wires moved and then be able to get um, the building across the field and very slowly inched along onto its new site again sited to look overlook the Housatonic River just as it did uh, in its original sighting on South Street. So that, that setting set a tone for the museum in which people were having fun and people were talking to each other and that to me it was really a, a gift because museums were quite stodgy in that day and age and we were not stodgy. We were not stodgy from day one.